Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. This is episode 8 in the timeline review of Christopher Watts. Those familiar with this channel will probably have noticed kind of a downtick in coverage of the Watts case. Um, there will be an uptick again uh, coming back to the end of the month uh, when the Lifetime movie comes out and also the uh, second Reels documentary. Um, I'll also be doing further analysis on the um, remaining insights from the Criminal Confessions documentary. So uh, look out for that sort of in the uh, final week or so of January. And then around about once a week, uh, I'll be doing a timeline review uh, of the chronological um, evolution, um, not evolution, but the laying down of the media narrative in the order that it was laid down um, as recorded on uh, CrimeRocket.com in the blog post, Christopher Watts, What Else Do We Know? If you're interested in um, staying up to date with these particular episodes, then please subscribe. Um, also, if you have any commentary on the content, uh, like, share, leave a comment, uh, and let's get started. So episode 7 concluded about 114 or so points um, for the month of August, but in effect it was really just um, half of the month of August, um, even less than that actually, because I think the coverage only started really around about the time of Chris Watts' arrest, uh, so it was really just about the last 7 to 10 days of August. Um, the September um, chronology, the, the September review, is 67 points. This um, episode will cover the first 10 of them. Um, it's actually far more than 67 points just because a lot of the points have got sub-bullets and so on. So um, September also has um, quite a lot of um, information to work through. Let's begin with point number one. Um, by early September, just three weeks after the murders that rock Colorado, the Chris Watts case has become an obsession on Facebook. Shanann painted a portrait of the perfect family on social media. Homemade videos and photos she posted show what seemed to be a doting father and happily married couple. Eight years later, we have two kids, we live in Colorado, and he's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Shanann said in one of her Facebook Live videos promoting her business. Other videos show Chris playing with Celeste and Bella, while Shanann can be heard from behind the camera laughing and playing along. But that picture-perfect image was shattered when Frederick Police, along with Weld County prosecutors, arrested Chris Watts for killing his own family, an unborn child, and then allegedly hiding their bodies at a Weld County oil and gas site where he worked. People from around the world are now combing through Shanann's Facebook videos for answers or any clue to help them understand how a family who seems so happy could end this tragically. And I think this paragraph kind of sums up the, the reason, not just for the obsession in September 2018, but the longevity of the Chris Watts case. It's kind of a indictment of us, of our society, of social media, of just the way we are as people when we see something like this um, completely invalidated. Um, you know, when this this um, particular um, reference touches on painting a portrait of the perfect family on social media, how many of us do that? How many of us paint perfect portraits of ourselves? Um, you know, how many of us paint perfect portraits of our partners, of our children, of, of anything? And um, Shanann did this kind of, to, to, kind of in an excessive way, just in terms of uh, the normal person. Obviously, in terms of um, uh, uh, multi-level marketing, um, one would say it's not necessarily excessive. Um, it's difficult to be 
um, fair and clear on that point because I think you'd have to be a multi-level marketer yourself to look at how much Shanann was posting and say, well, was that, was that average? Was that normal? What is certainly interesting is that Shanann didn't really post a, a lot towards the end of her life. Um, and this is something I've actually covered in and am covering in the Atkinson transcripts, which is available only on Patreon. Um, but it's just where even Nicole Atkinson said she was really surprised that when um, Chris Watts went to visit Shanann in North Carolina, there just weren't any photos of him um, during that particular week. She expected to see photos of him and she didn't. And she said they were not even selfies of Shanann herself. And she said that surprised her because Shanann was constantly taking selfies. And um, I think it's worth just thinking about this whole idea of, you know, you sing about and you tell the world about your your um, the shiny side, right? You sing your own praises, you you um, you know show a polished exterior, but when things aren't looking so good, then that's hidden away. Then you don't tell people about that, and. What that creates is a, is a kind of a momentum and a kind of a collusion and a, a kind of a conspiracy of silence. What I mean is if everybody does that, if everybody just shows the good side and, and you know, when things are going well, then you are going to have a situation where not just one person, but everybody is going to also be motivated to hide away when things aren't going so well and that's not a very authentic um, society that's a that's a schizophrenic society it's a deceitful society it's telling everyone when things are good and when things are bad not telling them hiding it away keeping secrets and basically being disingenuous you know a more authentic way would be maybe to be a little bit less um, vocal about the happy moments and just maybe enjoy them for what they are not try to you know put every kind of you know family moment whether it's a birthday or christmas onto social media just keep some things for yourself enjoy them for what they are without having to show other people them because part of that show makes it not fun you know makes it not enjoyable makes it not genuine even so, um, that I think is quite a powerful message from the Watts case, is this careful attempt to sketch a perfect picture. And that is what everyone thought they, they were seeing. And um, it certainly wasn't a perfect picture. You know, beneath a perfect picture was serious financial malaise, infidelity, um, poor health and a couple, you know, a family that was being torn apart, a family that was um, in some senses um, not getting along, not happy together anymore, certainly from some sides more than others. And then let's go to point number two. And again, bear in mind, this is very early in the uh, narrative, um, September 2018 was, was barely two weeks after the incident. So, you know, the discovery hadn't been released and one needs to see it within that context. But according to the arrest affidavit, Chris said he went into a rage and strangled Shanann. This is Chris's version of what happened. It's the heat of the, it's the heat of passion defense, but, but is it true? Now, what's interesting about that defense is it later was, deconstructed and discredited and invalidated by the district attorney. In court, um, uh, Michael Rourke said that this wasn't, um, he didn't kill Shanann in a rage, it was a cold, calculated um, crime, right? And then when the second confession came out, Chris Watts was still stuck on the, he went into a rage thing. Um, just that he was sort of blinded by rage when he started strangling Shanann. 
And I think his reason there was that she he wouldn't be able to see the kids. And then he kills the kids himself. I mean, if that's supposed to make any kind of sense. I've written extensively in not only in books, but also blogs on the subject of that somebody just snapped. <clears throat> Sorry, in inverted commas. There's just this idea that why did this crime happen? Because someone just snapped. Um, to be honest, I find this whole thing infuriating. <laughs> uh, the reason is, as soon as you make this um, statement, what you're trying to do is divorce the reason why someone is murdered just to kind of a um, almost like random um, mood swing, you know, that um, it had nothing to do with the actual um, family dynamics. It had nothing to do with the uh, dynamics of the marriage. It had nothing to do with the financial circumstances. It had nothing to do with actual circumstances. It had nothing to do with the fact that Chris Watts was having an affair and his motives. It had nothing to do with um, the fabric kind of around the, the family in terms of the, the sort of recent backstory, you know, the, the five, six week separation, Nutgate, um, uh, and, and just the whole, you know, run up going over a long period of time. It had nothing to do with the personality of Chris Watts as an introvert and Shanann's um, work on, on as, a, as a promoter, you know, on social media. No, 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 it had nothing to do with that. It was just Chris Watts just snapped. And what I find incredible just about that argument is that's actually good enough for a lot of people. A lot of people will go on forums and they will con try to convince one another that, you know what, I think Chris Watts just snapped. And that, so is that what happened? So, you know, we, we sort of almost at two years later now, is that what happened? Chris Watts just snapped and murdered three people. Now, there are crimes that do happen where someone just snaps and you tend to know what that looks like. Um, I'll give an example. Um, the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson is where someone just snapped and there you see um, a kind of impulsive crime with blood all over the place and a very poorly managed crime scene, you know, footprints coming, you know, leaving the, the crime scene, uh, blood left all over the place, eyewitnesses, and so on. Um, that is a he-just-snapped crime. However, that's also just not uh, something random. You know, you've got to look at what were the personalities of the people involved, what is the backstory of the people involved, and there is a backstory. Um, you have the same thing with Oscar Pistorius. Did he just snap and just fire through the bathroom door? Now, there's also a backstory there, a backstory of infidelity and cheating and a lot of money on, on the cards and insecurity because the one person has a disability and the beautiful model doesn't. So even in a scenario where there is um, a kind of a impulse um, triggering event, it's still not just a case of he just snapped. It still comes from um, the wellspring of criminal psychology. It comes from, it's kind of an accident that's waiting to happen. And so um, I, I'm allergic to people who say he just snapped, just as I'm allergic to hearing that this person's a narcissist or that one's a psychopath. What, what this is, is an attempt to reduce um, the complexity of human behavior to a single word and it's just not it's not it's not only not true it's um it's 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 kind of a um when i say misdirection i don't mean it's intentional but um it's certainly a misunderstanding in that sense so so that really was the source of people thinking that Chris Watts just snapped is, is from the actual arrest affidavit where, you know, he was talking about something that we know wasn't true, you know, that Shanann strangled her children and that set him, him off into a rage. And anyone who knows Chris Watts would know he's not the kind of guy to lose his temper. 
He's not the kind of guy to lose his cool. Everybody said that about him. Um, you know, he, he held all of that in, all of that emotion inside of himself. I was going to say information inside of himself, but that's also what he tends to do. He holds um, things inside of himself. That's that's the nature of the introvert. Point number three, a source who has spoken with Watts in jail tells people that the 33-year-old was aware of the funeral proceedings but had no input in, in it. He knew better than to suggest anything, the source says. Um, I found this um, just very interesting, the, the, the words, you know, he knew better than to suggest anything. It just made me think, you know, that kind of explains Chris Watts, I think, in a... In a nutshell, um, I think it explains Chris Watts when he was being interrogated. I think it explains Chris Watts, um, you know, probably as a as a mechanic and as an oil worker. And I think it explains Chris Watts in terms of his marriage. Um, he would sort of take a step back and let, let others sort of take the lead. Obviously, in a situation like the funeral, um, it would be difficult if he did want to have input, but it wouldn't be completely um, strange if he wanted input. I mean, you could you could obviously understand people ignoring his input, but um, you know, people could also um, you could you could see how he, he might want to have input. But the fact that he just didn't even doesn't sound like he tried to have any input. That just sounds exactly like Chris Watts, a guy resigned to his fate, resigned to just a guy full of resignation. And, you know, if you take another case where there was a family wiped out, um, you have the case of David Bain. David Bain was actually charged, found guilty of, of this is a guy from New Zealand, of wiping out his entire family, and then la later he was acquitted. Um, and I think he even, I'm not sure if he won compensation even from the New Zealand government, but in that case, um, David Bain wanted to actually sing at the funeral and he wanted to do all sorts of things. So this idea that you would have absolutely no um, input in a funeral of your family, um, you know, I don't think it's that strange in terms of the criminal uh, aspect. Um, the... What's quite interesting in New Zealand is people are very split about whether David Bain uh, is guilty or not. But, um, you know, you've got to look at a case like that and say, OK, well, if he's innocent, then who is guilty? And th there's, a, there's been quite a rush to, to be on, on the side of David Bain, but then no one else has been sort of... Um, it's not very clear who did who committed this crime if it wasn't David Bain. I think one of the conspiracies is that his father committed, killed the whole family, then killed himself, and then decided to spare David. You know, saying, "Okay, well, I don't think I think you deserve to live, but but nobody else does, and I'm going to kill myself as well." But then you would wonder that if he did that, why wouldn't he leave a note saying, um, I've killed myself, and by the way, David is innocent in his note. Anyway, that's a separate trial. Um, if we go to point number four, um, cadaver dogs are the reason Chris was forced to confess. When they were bought, brought into the home, they alerted to all three victims, which proves all three were murdered inside the home. Um this is an error. Um, I think the cadaver dogs um, did um, play a role in everything. I think the cadaver dogs did show some interest and, and show the authorities that they were, <clears throat> um, I wouldn't say on the right track, but, but there was some interest from the dogs showing that although the crime scene appeared invisible, um, the dogs seemed to be saying, the, the dogs seemed kind of agitated. And you kind of had a situation where, where one dog alerted somewhere, but the other dog didn't confirm it. So um, the, the cadaver dogs didn't... Um, uh,
disprove that something had happened. Um, in effect, they proved something had happened or they showed that something had happened. They just didn't show it enough or, or human beings couldn't quite get clarity on what they were saying, what they were sort of barking at. And it kind of makes sense because there was evidence that was destroyed, evidence that was cleaned. So if the cadaver dogs were saying something, they were saying it in a limited way. They were saying maybe something happened. Yeah, I can't quite give you a proper signal here because the signal I'm getting isn't, um, you know, it's not clear. Um, but there's definitely something, right? I know when I wrote um, the first book in the narrative, I was quite sure that the, you know, I was quite sure that that um, there would be cadaver traces and that the dogs did pick them up. And I was quite surprised when the evidence came out that there was a little bit of uncertainty from the dogs. You know, the dogs are usually really on point, almost with superhuman um, capacities. And, and yet in this case, I won't say they were defeated, but they were certainly frustrated. And um, so it turns out, I think the reason, you know, if you want to answer that question, what is the reason Chris was forced to confess? I think it was, it's a little bit complex. I, I would say part of it was if he committed the crime because he wanted to be with Kessinger, the fact that Kessinger told the police about the affair kind of took away his incentive. In other words, if Kessinger didn't go to the police and she kind of maybe pretended that they weren't having an affair or that it wasn't serious or something like that. Chris Watts may have thought, well, you know, maybe I still have a chance. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can get out of jail and we can still live happily ever after. Right. And so, so you can definitely see how her going to the police kind of pulled the carpet from under him. And it, also showed him to be a liar. It showed, showed that while he was somewhat convincing and the, the police didn't quite have a case against him, even after the polygraph, um, they weren't really sort of focused on an affair or anything. And it was only after that, I think when they got intel from the FBI, that they were convinced that Chris Watts was hiding something, not just the affair, but because he was trying so hard to hide the affair, wasn't he hiding something else? And just bear in mind what they're thinking is, we don't know what he's done, but th this family are missing. Also, why would he be hiding an affair when all of this stuff's happening? Why would that be his priority? You know, if Chris Watts was innocent, he probably would have said, you know, I'm really worried about my family. Um, you know, I have been having an affair, but I, I still... Um, I'm worried. I'm, I'm worried about my children. And um, the fact that he wasn't, and he was also pretending not to, um, was weird. I think Chris Watts got confused with his own bullshit. He was sort of trying to convince Nicole Kessinger that whatever had happened to his family wasn't a big deal. And then he thought that was the same way to play it with the cops. And I think he was, he was well, um, clearly wrong in that department. I think another aspect to be aware of is, you know, when Chris Watts is giving his sermon on the porch, the cadaver dogs were actually searching the house. So I think that may have kind of unsettled him and, and broke his concentration slightly. If, if he meant to think about it like this, if he was going to give just a one minute statement, you know, um, please come home. <clears throat> Excuse me, please come home what's happened, you know, um, blah, 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 um, the, the cadaver dogs may have thrown him off, the barking of the cadaver dogs. You can see him looking around a little bit nervously while they're barking. And this may have been also a strategy from law enforcement to have the media talking to him and preoccupying him um, while they are searching inside the house so that Chris Watts can't just suddenly change his mind and say, okay, do you mind... I don't really want you guys to carry on in the house, you know, when the dogs start barking. And the fact that he's talking to the media means he's sort of got to actively kind of make his case, pitch his story. So, so I think that's quite an interesting juxtaposition. Point number five, detectives believe Watts killed his children first 
and then killed his 15-week pregnant wife, the Daily Mail reports. This is a really important um, point to, to look at. Um, I think um, a lot of people don't agree with that. Um, True Crime Rocket Science has um, believed that from the beginning and, and maintained that throughout. Um, the only aspect about that that um, makes it a little bit difficult to believe is um, the whole idea of Chris Watts killing his children first meant he was, would then be locked into killing Shanann. So in other words, um, if, it, if he killed his children then and Shanann arrived home, she could theoretically find out, run away, and, and he could get into serious trouble. And that's kind of problematic. Um, it's quite hard to imagine somebody doing that. On the other hand, if he felt absolutely confident that he could and would kill Shanann in a way that he would absolutely make sure, then I guess it would make sense to kill his children first and also get that out of the way, so to speak. Um, and also, you know, um, the time element and the cleaning up element, um, given how little time he had to work with, even before he knew about the delayed flight, also would have made sense. The other reasons to believe the children were killed first as well, such as, um, you know, the neighbors not witnessing the children um, while they were barbecuing, while Chris Watts is barbecuing on the balcony. Um, the fact that Chris Watts's father, Ronnie, um, didn't FaceTime with his children um, that night, um, whereas Frank Grusick did, but it was quite early in the day. Then there's also the fact of the um, Shanann requesting photos of the children asleep in their beds. Chris Watts didn't provide those. So that's also um, interesting, especially when he provided photos of the children um, earlier in the day and earlier in the weekend. And then the another aspect which I think is very underestimated, is what did Chris Watts want to be doing on his last day before Shanann was back kind of for good? He wanted to talk to Kessinger. He wanted to have time. He wanted to be able to be with her. And what could get in the way of that? Well, his children. And so if he was considering letting his children live, then this is the, going to be the big test, which was on Sunday night before Shanann arrived home. Did he want to delay talking to Nicole Kessinger while putting the kids to bed and, and, and sorting out their things? Or did he want them completely out the way where he could have the television on and he could talk loudly and he could do whatever he wanted to do without the risk of the children wo waking up or being woken up. Bear in mind, he spoke to Kessinger for 111 minutes um, on Sunday night. And, you know, the question is, were the children um, awake then? Were they alive for that entire time? And it just seems very unlikely. Nicole Kessinger doesn't say at any point that Chris Watts interrupted their call to because he heard something or something like that. So there are quite a few reasons to believe that the children were killed first. According to police documents, Shanann was killed on August 13th, the same day she returned home from an out-of-state business trip. The charges allege that Watts killed Bella and Celeste between and including August 12th and 13th. So that was something I was very focused on very early on. Um, one way to determine if the children had been killed earlier is to test the cadaver traces. A stronger scent would obviously indicate an earlier death. So that was another aspect that, that was in my mind was that the children had been killed first and so th there, were, there would definitely be cadaver traces. If you want to counter argue and say, I think true crime rocket science is wrong, I think you're mistaken, your best argument is to say, well, I think the reason that the cadaver traces are so weak or non-existent is because the children hadn't been killed, and that's a very good argument. Um, but then you've, you've kind of got to make the same argument about Shanann and say, 
um, you know, was Shannon killed just before she was taken out of the house? Um, I don't believe that's true either. Um, I believe there was a lot of cleaning, and, and Chris Watts had the opportunity to clean his home. He had the entire Monday night, and Nicole Kessinger said that he was up late cleaning. I think he said the same thing to Jeremy Lindstrom. And um, if cadaver traces are very hard to destroy, um, they can easily be destroyed by using um, bleach. Uh, bleach destroys DNA and bleach destroys odors. And um, one fascinating um, confirmation of this that I got through researching the, the Patrick Frazee case was um, it was later known and proved that um, Kelsey Berrith was bludgeoned to death and, and died, and, and she spent also several hours, her, her, her remains were, were several hours inside uh, her Woodland Park home. And the crime scene was covered in blood for, actually for several days. And when dogs came into the house, that they didn't really find anything. Um, they alerted outside on the bumper of a vehicle. And I think there was kind of an alert uh, on Kelsey's clothing in the upstairs bathroom. But, but nothing, again, it was a, a kind of a mixed alert, not really giving the police confirmation that something definitely had happened. But something definitely had happened. And then we also found out from Crystal Kenny just how she managed to clean that crime scene in a way that defeated the dogs. And she spent four hours cleaning that crime scene kind of top to bottom, dressed kind of in a hazmat suit and filling up five or six garbage bags full of um, towels, clothing, rags, um, you know, covered in blood and all that kind of thing. And the amazing thing is, when she took all those garbage bags outside and, and rested them against Kelsey's Toyota, that was what left the cadaver trace. So can um, uh, cadaver dogs be um, fooled? Um, you know, can you cl clean a crime scene to the extent that you remove cadaver traces? Yes, you can. Bleach is also a very effective way of destroying DNA. So, so that's certainly true. And it's actually quite scary. It's scary that, that this is possible. But as, as possible as it is, um, we see in the Patrick Frazee case where there were no human remains ever found. There was a, a fragment of a tooth. Um, you did have cadaver dogs signaling um, quite strongly on Kelsey's car. And later on, Crystal Kenny said, well, that is, ex is exactly where I left the garbage bags. You know, I just left them against the car before I, you know, took them away. And then there was also an alert on, uh, um, on hay uh, bales of hay. And Crystal Kenny also said, well, that was where the, the plastic tote with Kelsey's remains inside was left. And so... Um, to be honest, I don't really think the alert on the Hale Bay is very strong, but um, the fact is Crystal Kenny said that was where um, uh, the remains were. And so what's incredible in the um, Kelsey Berrith case is that Kelsey was totally, you know, her, her body was totally destroyed, and yet these tiny little cadaver traces remained and the dogs um as much as was destroyed and removed, the dogs did pick up a little bit, and, and that shows their value. Point number six, the Daily Mail has mistakenly reported the following image as the last of Shanann Watts while she was still alive. Um, obviously, at this point, we didn't really know about the ring doorbell footage. Um, that is ultimately the last footage of Shanann alive. Um, Interestingly, in the caption provided by the Daily Mail, it says um, this photo of August 11. Um, I'm not sure whether that's correct. Um, I would have thought that that is August the 12th. Uh, I could be wrong, but um, I'm pretty sure that that image was taken on Sunday prior to their, their flight. Um, and then there was another image uh, taken 
on August 12th at, a, at around about 623 um, also just prior to their the flight and there you can see kind of a fuzzy image of Shanann and you know I'm very interested in the last photos of particular people um, it's often there is a um, an unnecessary amount of uncertainty and confusion about you know the last photo of a particular person. Uh, we've had that in the McCann case. We've had that in the um, uh, Ramsey case. We've had that in the Amanda Knox case. Um, it, it's quite quite common. Shanann Watts's final social media post and. You, you guys can correct correct us if it's wrong. Um, I'm not sure if if um, she did do additional social media after this. I think she may have posted that she's flying back to um, Colorado. That may have been the last post. Um, my memory is a bit fuzzy, but um, in any event, one of her last social media comments was after 6:30 um, in Tempe, Arizona, saying. Um, you know, the best way to leave Arizona is with you and Eddie and a loss of power while eating dinner. And so interestingly, kind of around this time, she contacted Chris Watts to say, you know, that uh, there'd been storms and um, the flight was delayed. And by that time, Chris Watts was already on the phone with Nicole Kessinger. He was so preoccupied with her that not only was he not preoccupied with his children, but he was also not seemingly aware of Shanann even trying to get hold of him, you know, including to say he only found out that her flight was delayed um, just before he expected her back. So just before like 11 o'clock that night. And I think that also shows the extent to which he was totally in love, totally head over heels, that he wasn't thinking properly. I mean, if he was about to um, murder Shanann, he was going to get off the phone really at the last moment and then put himself in, in a position to do whatever he was going to do. And then point number seven, I just provided a couple of early photos, both from social media and from the media, because um, I was just trying to figure out the crime scene. Again, bear in mind, at this point, we didn't have the discovery. We didn't have the body cam footage. So I wanted to kind of get an idea of... Um, the front door that Shanann entered, um, you know, where was there a keypad there? Where was the doorbell camera? What was the lighting like? I also wanted to know what was on the other side of the door. Um, what was the sort of interior blueprint of the house like? And I kind of quite quickly gravitated to the stairs. I, I very early on thought that um, the, the stairs, somewhere along the stairs, whether at the bottom halfway up on the first landing or just before the the loft i thought that was um, a likely place to commit a premeditated murder one of the reasons being if it's a stealth attack say from behind then what you're getting with the railing of the staircase is a kind of a barrier preventing someone from running to that side on the other side you've got the wall and in front of shenan you would have the stairs so if she's going to try and run away, um, she's, she's going to struggle. The person behind her is definitely going to have the advantage, not only because she's pregnant, but because she's carrying, um, you know, her handbag, her phone, and her suitcase. I know a lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people just imagine that Shanann uh, went to bed and, and whatever. Um, I don't think that is realistically imagining a premeditated, but I don't think a murderer would go and lie in bed and wait for his wife to arrive knowing how strong the possibility was that she was going to say are you cheating on me um what is that bill that you bought uh, and confront him he, he committed the crime the way he did because he didn't want to have that conversation he didn't want to risk that conversation he didn't want to risk a conflagration and shenan um coming out from under his control. He, he wanted to control her arrival back into the house and her leaving the house. He wanted to make sure she arrived and left in the way that he wanted it to happen, especially with the children being in the state that, that he'd also created. 
So this was all about Chris Watts taking control of his life, but also through taking control of the other lives around him. The status on September 4th, um, since he was put in jail, Watts has been placed under watch protocol, which is better known as suicide watch and must be checked on by a detention officer every five or ten minutes. Several times a day, someone enters Watts' cell to make sure he's alive and still in custody. There's also a cell check every day in which he has to be completely searched. For one hour each day, Watts is allowed out of his cell into a room where he is the only person present. He has also been denied access to television and is not allowed to have reading material in his cell. Um, that information kind of made me think that, you know, how long is Watts going to be able to keep up or, or just stay sane? And we find out in letters from Christopher that Chris Watts was quickly cracking um, because of this kind of treatment. Um, he was being jeered at by his fellow prisoners, but he was also going crazy just by suddenly being isolated in his cell, uh, getting no information. Um, I think the district attorney said Chris Watts kind of made one phone call to his father, couldn't get through, and then gave up, and then that was it. And we also know in retrospect that Chris Watts said that his defense attorneys asked him hundreds of times, um, these are his own words, whether he wants to make a plea deal, and Watts eventually said yes. And I think part of what he was winning through this is, is relief from this particular situation, that he wouldn't be in jail in uh, Colorado, he wouldn't be in a situation where people would be screaming at him and tormenting him, and so being tormented gave, I think, the district attorney leverage to say, so you, you know what it's like in jail. Um, do you want us to um, give you a opportunity to avoid that? And so I think that is that was what the plea deal was all about, not avoiding the death penalty. It was avoiding a harsher prison sentence in the prison population. Number nine, Chris Watts had a lot of secrets. Every day we learn more and more about him. Um, that's from people. I think that kind of story um, and also the one that I read right at the beginning gave me the, the, the sense of it resonating that this is the story about a two-face. This is the story about a man with two faces. This is the story about one side to the coin and the other side of the coin. This is the story about facades and presenting, um, you know, one appearance to the world and another, and behind the social media is another appearance. And, and that's got to do um, not just with Chris Watts, but, and, or Shanann, but, but with many of us. And so that, that was the part that I wanted to, um, uh, kind of acknowledge to the, the two-faced title. Number 10, uh, was the fact that Chris Watts was younger than Shanann a factor in his wanting to get rid of her the way that he did? What's the inference in a younger man with a slightly older woman pregnant for the third time? And what this really was was just me putting down a thought that had occurred to me then. You know, is there any bearing in this case that, that Chris Watts was younger? And I've seen some people think that that's a ridiculous thing to say. You know, he was one year younger. What is that? Um, the point is, um, when a man is having an affair, um, he's likely to, to be with someone younger than himself. And look at that juxtaposed to Shanann. Shanann's older than what he is. Not a lot older, but still older. And someone who is younger doesn't have children doesn't have a family, and, and that is um, kind of an immature side, I think, to Chris Watts, where he's imagining a return to that same somewhat fancy-free immaturity where he can go um, sandboarding and he can, um, you know, go and watch, um, you know, drag races or whatever it is um, and eat at restaurants. It's, it's this younger part of Chris that that he's trying to give life to and he wants to feel alive again. And the pregnancy is actually reminding him that 
that side to him is dying and obsolete and he doesn't like that. Kessinger is reminding him that there's the side to him that can exist and can be happy and can enjoy certain things that he that he resigned himself not to having. And so I think this is quite an important question. I can understand how some people can resent the question and say, um, you know, Shanann was barely older than him, but you're not getting to the criminal psychology here. It's not how you feel about um, the age of your partner or how your partner feels about your ages. It's what Chris Watts thought in his situation and how that played into his criminal psychology. So I think you'll agree, even though we're going back through the timeline and even though some things are clearly wrong and some things are clearly misinformed and some things are clearly, um, you know, one had a lot of information to go um, after some of these points, um, by going through it in the chronology, it does raise certain fascinating questions and issues and arguments and um, uh and contentions and you know one can also go through it this way and say were you right in in making this um hypothesis of the children being killed first were you right in your thinking let's revisit it let's look, let's look at it again and um i think it's important to do it's important to go back again and see how you came up with a particular hypothesis um and and test it and a, and a good hypothesis will get stronger a bad hypothesis will get weaker and will be susceptible to change. Okay, and so uh, that's the end of um, episode eight. Um, look out for the third episode in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann TCRS debunk. Uh, it's to do with the um, Netflix series, and that'll be on this channel possibly later today. Uh, if you want to catch that coverage, um, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. On Patreon, um, I'm putting up an audiobook version of Christmas Star. Um, chapter 3 is already available. It's already um, posted on Patreon. So if you want to catch the um, audio version, it's under the $5 tier uh, at Patreon slash TCRS. Thank you for listening, and I will see you guys next time.